example of Instaflex, our most powerful joint formula ever. It's the number one selling joint supplement at GNC. Claim your sample today. 1-800-514-3546. 15 seconds. Needs. And you guys are live. Yes, Instaflex is available at GNC, Walgreens, and CVS, where you can only get your complimentary sample by calling 1-800-514-3546. 1-800-514-3546. Dave Packer, ABC News. A good Sunday morning. Holy, holy, holy. It's the way to start the day uh, here on a beautiful Sunday morning in the Coachella Valley. Welcome to a brand new program starting today for the very first time here on radio. It's uh, the eternal perspective. Start your Sunday morning with a different perspective and eternal perspective. It's brought to you by Men of Messiah and it's uh, featuring uh, Pastor Chuck DeVoe and yours truly, Rich Gilgallon. Chuck? Good morning, my brother. Boca Tov. <laughs> <laughs> I know, just enough Hebrew to uh, say good morning. Uh, let's see what we got going here. Make sure that's going up. Yeah, I'm sure people will be patient with us as we inaugurate this. We're just trying to get uh, a, a couple of bugs ironed out as we get going here on uh, News Talk 920 KPSI. It's great to be with you. Thanks to Steve's here. The Lord's provided yes. Steve for us to help yes. us out. So. Steve. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Now we're cooking with gas. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Yes, let's. Uh, we thank uh, Steve Kelly for rising early this morning and uh, coming yeah. in to make sure that the the, uh, the ship is running right. Chuck, good to see you. Thanks, Rich. This is a uh, culmination of uh, of a lot of people's uh, hard work and effort, and mm -hmm. and really, it's been a dream of uh, ours uh, for a while to to uh, to begin a radio ministry, and uh, we're, we're thrilled to be here at uh, KPSI early on a Sunday morning. Tell us a little bit about. Uh, about your background for people that might not be familiar with you. Let me uh, let me accentuate, uh, if I may, but just for a moment, the comment you made about us uh, <clears throat> having this as a vision or a dream. Uh, the supreme foundation and motivation for all of this that culminates in this moment uh, is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ, the Prince of Life, and the one to whom you and I, Rich, ultimately indebted with our whole being. So. The prayer is uh, that this inaugural, the genesis of Men Messiah ministry being communicated through the airwaves would uh, exalt the king. Well, tell us a little bit. Of, tell us a little bit about uh, of Men of Messiah, uh, right. where they meet, uh, who you know, in a general sense, uh, who they are, how you uh, began this particular uh, uh, journey of, of your long ministry, and tell us a little bit about. Uh, the foundations of uh, Men of Messiah and what it means to you. Okay, let me address those questions, not necessarily in chronological order, but uh, as they come to mind. Uh, Men of Messiah ministry, which is our moniker uh, that we as men use to uh, serve the Lord Jesus Christ as uh, Bible-believing Christians, or as biblicists, began in the early uh, part of the first decade of this century. Uh, Jim Westford was very instrumental in helping me get going and, and as it has evolved over the years we've come to this present point where now uh, presently I might just say we're meeting uh, Men of Messiah is meeting at the Desert Island Country Club mm -hmm. on uh, is that Frank Sinatra? Yeah, it is Frank, Sinatra, Frank Sinatra at 7 a.m. on Friday mornings and any men out there who uh, are inclined to investigate the scriptures the ancient writings of the Judeo-Christian religion with us show up on uh, Friday mornings at 7 o'clock, we meet in the women's <laughs> locker room. We are in the women's locker yes. room uh, pr presently for the summer. <laughs> <laughs> Which uh, it's very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, and the Lord has a sense of humor, I think. And well, they're very kind uh, over there to, to allow us the, you know, the, the uh, area. And uh, it's really a great blessing. It's a beautiful room, very comfortable room. 
right. uh, comfortable couches and, and uh, chairs, and mm -hmm. and you know you do your teaching uh, your teaching ministry there. Tell us a little bit. Although about those that are prone to fall asleep quite easily, I I, I do not want sitting on the couch. You can't now. You can't fall asleep like you, like you, you No, you you're, can't fall asleep when you're uh, when you are preaching the word. Yeah, right. Nobody falls asleep. So what was your question? Well, I, as far as uh, you know, this has been your 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 dream, uh, your vision, this particular. Uh, sort of road that you've taken with Men of Messiah, but uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, for those who are just turning in for the first time, give us a little of uh, a background in exactly who you are, how did you get to this point, mm -hmm. uh, why when you were a young man uh, did you uh, decide to enter the ministry, the Dallas Theological Seminary, what was right. it, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, did you go into the ministry right after high school, or was excellent? That okay, I, I got your drift, and, and uh, what an honor it is to talk about my testimony, which I usually call bragamonies, but let me uh, risk it and just share with you a few points. I was uh, vice president of student body at Cal State University of Fresno, and uh, uh, very active politically. Uh, was considered myself to be a moderate, and was bound for Sacramento as administrative assistant for Ken Matty who at that time was the uh, senator from that congressional district. Uh, Is that right, yeah, Chuck? Yeah, that's a yeah. surprise to me. I didn't yeah, realize we, well, I like to we shared that political <laughs> background. That's yeah. a surprise for me. Yeah, he was going to put me in his office up there uh, after I graduated with my master's degree in, in social work. And I was around 26, 27 years old, something like that. Uh, spent all of my, from 18 on it, in higher education. Well, I... Uh, I went through a series of personal crises, uh, similar to what many go through in their life, mm -hmm. and uh, so I'm not going to bore you with the details. But it brought me to my knees, and I recognized that my life, uh, though devoted to this area, was, was certainly incomprehensibly not fulfilling. And it was in that moment, in that moment of despair, uh, I make no bones about it, I don't apologize for it, a great want and, and lack. Uh, that I came face to face with the Savior of the world, mm. Yeshua HaMashiach. And from that time on, Richie, the paradigm shift made its turn, and I've never looked back. And so you went... Uh, let, me tell you, let, me, let me tell you, yeah. let me tell you, I walked into Ken Maddy's office after I became a Christian mm -hmm. by faith in Christ for the free gift of eternal life. And uh, he had all kinds of perks for me. Private parking at Santa Anita Park, and you know when it comes oh, to that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> free show passes and all. That. So I, I said, Ken, I have a, I have something I need to tell you. He said, What's up? I said, I'm gonna I'm, I'm not gonna be able to take your position. And uh, he said, What? And he says, I'm not gonna be able to take your position uh, as administrative assistant in Sacramento. I said, Why? Because I've taken a position with the Lord Jesus Christ as His disciple. He said, You gotta be out of your mind. You're whacked. That was his first. Uh, oh yeah, he, he had no comprehension. You know, here I am, a young fledgling uh, Christian. I have no, no real sensitivity to people who don't believe like I do. I thought everybody, you know, would be excited about the fact that I was born again and all of that stuff. Uh, and you know, I had a little bit of immaturity, not yet tempered with the wisdom. Hopefully, that it's tempered with now. But anyway, I, uh, he said, "Wow." He said, "He sat down." He said, "All right, he said, you, you're passing up a great future." He said, "I really had great plans for this." I'm sorry, but. I'm, I, I'm already conflicted philosophically as well as theologically with the meaning, the purpose of life, and the whole area of politics. And I said, one thing I want to share with you, Ken, before I leave. There's, here, here is a foundational principle in this paradigm shift. I had worked as a social change agent all my life. I was involved in politics on campus. That was, that was the, Rich, you know, that was the day during the student revolt. Of course. Okay, SDS and all of that. I, I met. Elvis Cleaver and all of it, Bobby, uh, uh, especially him, Bobby Seal, Bobby Seals and those guys. Anyway, I said, I find it, it. I said I had an epiphany. I said I now realize that the problem that I wanted to change as a social systems change agent is not the system; it's the people, it's the heart of man. That needs to be changed. If that doesn't get changed, then, you know, nothing is going to ultimately, you can fix band aids, that sort of thing. So anyway, he, he looked at me, he said, wow. He said, I've never heard anybody say that. I said, well, you certainly would not have heard me say that prior to my meeting and relationship with Jesus Christ and the Word of God. That was the end of that. So then I went to seminary. 
So you went to Dallas Theological Seminary. I did, Rich, yes. One of the foremost theological seminaries uh, really in the, in the Well, I'm a little biased, but I, uh, I, 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 would, I, I would agree with that. And what was your experience like there? Tough. Tough. I'm a renegade, yeah. off the streets kind of guy. Yeah. You ready, you ready for a story? Can I, I'm yeah, sure. Story. That's why we're here. All right. This is good. This is really good. By the way, this is uh, uh, this is Eternal Perspective, brought to you by me. <laughs> this is what we call a reset. L let me just reset here, Chuck. Okay, all right. This is called a reset in the radio business. All this right. is uh, this is uh, Eternal Perspective, brought to you by Men and Messiah with Chuck DeVoe, right here on News Talk 920 KPSI. Thank you, Rich. Uh, and, and all of this will fit into the Eternal Perspective with which we're going to frame our ministry from this point forward. I'm a, I'm a year and a half out of the spiritual moon, so to speak, mm -hmm. okay, as a Christian. I'm in a seminar. I, I just want to study the Word of God. I want to study the original languages. I want to learn theology. I'm just, I'm just enamored. Man. Gung-ho, right? Oh, now. yeah, exactly. So, but I'm sitting next to guys who grew up in Christian families. Not guys that are off the street, that were fornicators and immoral people, mm -hmm. and, you know, street people, and, you know, Solid people, graduates of, of major universities, and and graduates of colleges like Harvard and Yale. And, and Christian, so I really I'm intimidated. I always thought I was pretty hot stuff until I sat with, <laughs> with, with this august crowd. Of, but the Lord settled me down and said, "This is part of this is going to start your journey in discipleship." Well, one day I got this is a story I'm going to tell you real quick. Uh, how much time do we have? Plenty of time. <laughs> I'm sitting in the cafeteria with my fellow people. And uh, the woman I was married to at that time, I got married uh, it was a bad marriage uh, for me. Uh, probably worse for her. But anyway, her brother uh, gave me a, I didn't have a, a, a sports jacket. You have to wear sports jackets and ties. And yeah, the theological yeah, which, yeah. Is, which is a totally different experience for me. So I'm sitting in the cafeteria and I got some coffee and I put my hands in this pocket and I pull out this joint. <laughs> <laughs> this marijuana cigarette, right, right there at Dallas. So you're turning red on me. This is this was your brother-in-law's joint. This is my brother-in-law's joint. But you didn't know who's joint. No, I, but, I, you know, at first I just put, and there's and there's a couple of professors sitting there and people at the table, and I said, oops, <laughs> and I put it back in my pocket. It's a borrowed jacket. No, that was not that was not planned. Right. Know, that was not staged. It was very real, and and to that from that point on, it got around the school. Nobody said anything to me about it from, from the authoritative yeah. strata. But other students, they said, that was a real moment, man. Isn't that amazing? That was a real moment. Well, you know, I think it's interesting, and just to transition a little bit from, from your experience to the experience that I find, uh, you know, more often than not. There's a notion, I think, in the culture that, uh, you know, uh, uh, born-again Christians are all these people that are perfect. You know, they think they're perfect. Uh, you know, that they're they're better than they think they're better than everybody else. They're you know, and really, uh, in my experience is that uh, people come to Jesus uh, in different ways. There are people, and I've known them in my life who who uh, were born into a devout uh, Christian family, who went to Christian kindergarten and on to, as you point out, some of these guys that maybe that you were with in the seminary. Right. Went to, Christian grammar school and Christian high school, and and uh, and, and God bless. Them. I mean, what a, an amazing thing! Then there's other people like like me, who who crawled through the dirt to get uh, to Jesus, who had no other friend and uh, no other uh, no other way to go. Amen. And so, you know, there is that uh, the real truth about who comes to to Jesus. Uh, generally, it's people that are just defeated and 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 beaten. Uh, and I, I still can recall uh, reading the gospel and reading that, uh, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, you know, and I will give you rest. The first time I read that, mm -hmm. I sobbed for a, an hour because right, so. I, that's what I was looking for. I, I was looking for rest from that emotional turmoil. So. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, if we will get into uh, the theological underpinnings of what we're sharing right now and, and make some clear and definitive distinctions with regard to Min Messiah and her ministry, theologically, that sort of thing. But let me just say, Rich, that the, uh, 
whether you come to faith in Christ for eternal life, the free gift of eternal life and eternal salvation, as an eight-year-old. I mean, how much baggage can an eight-year-old, like my twin daughters were eight years old when I lived in Jesus for eternal life and got saved and regenerated. Or you come at, like you and I came, on our knees, uh, and more in line with the depiction of that invitation that our Lord gives to people in that text that we were talking about from the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, the, the point is that irrespective of the character qualities or the dynamics that surround the event of each individual, one thing remains constant. And that is because the because of the enormous, incomparable, majestic price that the Son of God paid for the redemption of man. Every single individual, irrespective of circumstances, upbringing, all that, can receive the free gift of the eternal life, eternal sal salvation from eternal damnation by one simple act of faith in Him. That's the Messiah. Tell us a little about that, because Chuck, that is where the rubber. Yeah of men of Messiah yeah. meets the road. And, and this is not uh, something that you, you may hear preached uh, in uh, in your church. Uh, mm -hmm. As you get ready this morning to probably uh, make your way to, to uh, one of the many, many churches here in the Coachella Valley. Uh, talk to us about, this is the core value that I find in men of Messiah. Tell us a little bit about, uh, about this free gift. This is a free gift. Only free because of the as you point out, the one who paid the price. The paid the price. Tell us, price. tell us a little bit about the price paid. Okay, before I do that, Rich, uh, let me uh, suggest that anybody that's interested in pursuing uh, the belief system or the creed of faith that, again, undergirds Minna Messiah ministry, they can go to our website, mm -hmm. uh, www.minnamessiah.com or .org, go to the book that's in quote the creed of faith and read it. It's a PDF format, or I'll be glad to send them copies of it. We have a full, complete, comprehensive expression and exposition of our doctrinal statement, what we believe and why, from a biblical perspective. Um, but with that, with that said, uh, let me let me uh, let me appeal to our mission statement. Uh, you have it in front of you, and, and uh, those of who, who are supportive of the Messiah Ministry, and you're all over the country right now, Boston, other places, Atlanta, Louisville, Oregon, whatever. You dear, dear brothers, um, let me, uh, I have a copy of this, let me appeal to the two-fold mission statement that we should have in front of it, mm -hmm. uh, which I think will answer this question and make some important distinctions. Then a Messiah ministry, in my heart, as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, is to preach the gospel about Jesus Christ and proclaim the message of eternal life. A free gift received by faith in Christ and Him alone. <clears throat> That's the first uh, component, the first fold of the twofold. Wait a minute. Now statement. wait. When you say free gift, you mean you don't have to, uh, you don't have to uh, uh, give all your money uh, to a, uh, you know, to, to somebody? Are you... Only to me, Ray. Really. <laughs> and, and in your case, I'm going to give you special yeah, dispensation because you don't have much. Well, okay. people. I mean, this is what people hear. I mean, if they watch television, they may see a guy on television say, "Well, you know, you know yeah, uh, great. I, I don't care what they hear. You know, uh, first of all, I'm not a scholar. I'm a student. Right. So don't refer to me as a scholar anymore. I'm a student. A biblical student. A biblical student. I will graduate as a scholar, hopefully, at the end of this life, and then continue to learn in the presence of the Lord Himself, who is the scholar, by the way. Right. All right. Capital S. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, let me. Let me. I expound for a few minutes upon the distinction between the gospel about Jesus Christ and the message of eternal life. Okay. This is a distinction that uh, became clear to me in the study of the scripture about 10 years ago uh, under the leadership and guidance of my own mentor who is in the presence of the Lord now, uh, Zane Clark Hodges, who is a professor of mine at uh, Dallas Seminary and a dear friend and brother. Um, <clears throat> he, uh, <clears throat> one of the things that became evident to me is that People don't get saved from hell or receive the free gift of eternal life by believing in the gospel. That's a misnomer. There's nowhere in, in the New Testament, Rich, where the gospel, which means good news, mm -hmm. however it's quantified or qualified, is the object of saving faith. Never. The gospel about Jesus, that's why I, I refer to it in our mission statement, in the Messiah, is all the good news about Yeshua HaMashiach, the eternal Son of God who became man 
and did what he did on this earth. Preaching, teaching, culminating in his atoning, full atoning sacrificial work on the cross for mankind and for mankind's sin. Plus everything else about him. Old and New Testament, you collate all the information about Jesus, the Christ, the eternal Son of God, pre-cross, pre-incarnation, post-cross, and up to his second coming is all good news. It's good. Again, uh, the word uh, euangelion, which is the noun, means good news. Uh, euangelizomai or euangelizo means to preach good news or glad tidings. Uh, those terms are used uh, a total of 132 times in the Bible. So, well, what, what better news could there be? Well, that's good news, but you don't need to believe. Let, let me make this distinction, Rich. Uh, bear with me here, because this is an important distinction in the Messiah ministry. Right. We often tell people to believe the gospel and they get saved. That is a biblical misnomer. Hmm. In fact, in the gospel of the so-called gospel of John, let me back up just a moment. The gospel of Mark Look at the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Luke, and the Gospel of John as the superscription. This is the Gospel according to Matthew. That particular use of the word gospel is a literary device that the ancient writers used to express to the reader that what you're going to read from this point on is the holy biography of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. The gospel. The, the term gospel right. at the top of, you know, you open your book, it says the gospel according to Mark. Right. right. Okay. Right. The word gospel. This is the the holy, esteemed, honored biography of the person you're going to read about in this book. That's what the word gospel means. If you research every other occurrence of the word gospel in context, you'll never find the biblical writer, I don't believe, whether in the gospels or in the epistolary literature, telling the reader or the listener that they must believe in the gospel in order to get saved. The gospel is the good news that we share about Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you an example, and then we're going to talk about the free gift of eternal life. When I was a Roman Catholic, and I was, I was raised in the Roman Catholic uh, tradition, and I thank that tradition for some of the foundational truths that it taught me. They taught the gospel about Jesus. Jesus was the Son of God, God incarnate, fully God, deity. They talked about the, uh, uh, the Trinity and all the fundamental Protestant doctrines that you and I hold to. That was the gospel about Jesus. But nobody got saved or received eternal life by believing those truths. I bet if you went out into the streets today and you pulled people, do you believe Jesus? Yeah. Do you believe his son? Not sure. Do you believe he died on the cross? Sure. For your sins? Sure. Do you believe uh, that he, there's a trade? Well, maybe. I don't know. But yeah, well, let me, for sake of argument, let me say, I, yeah, I do. None of that gets a person saved. Okay. So that's the gospel about Jesus Christ. Minimus I ministry preaches the gospel about... This, I can't fathom talking or interacting with anybody and sharing with them good news about a better person, a grander person than Jesus Christ. But even if they understand and appreciate all of that, that's not what's going to deliver them from eternal judgment or hell or impart eternal life. Therefore, second part of this first of twofold mission statement is we preach the message of eternal life. Right. So you ask me, Chuck. What is all this good news? Chuck, what is all this good news? <laughs> Richard's a good man. Uh, what does all this point me to? I mean, what, what's the practical benefit from it? Well, all this good news about Jesus Christ, focusing primarily on his atoning death on the Christ, cross for the uh, sin of mankind and to pay the penalty, to satisfy his Father's justice and need for holiness, all of that points to this reality. This is the message that we should be preaching in evangelism. John 6, 47, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. That's the message of eternal life. John 3, 16. It doesn't, it doesn't say uh, has eternal life as long as you uh, are baptized. Or uh, if you re repent or any of those other things. Okay. The message it's a period. It's a period, not a comma. Clear, clearest, most succinct statement of the message of eternal life in all of Scripture, in my opinion. But this is undergirded or something. Uh, supported by John three sixteen, right? You know, but let's let, let's focus on this on that sentence in the gospel because all right. on that sentence, uh, you know, there's there's been so much confusion in in, uh, in so many different churches, and it seems like Chuck a very simple 
sentence to understanding gratitude. No, it doesn't seem like it. It, it is. is. Yeah, it doesn't appear to be that way. It is. Okay. It is. If you, uh, my wife and I were discussing this uh, the other day, she doesn't like me to call her my bride, my wife. Uh, she, we and I were discussing. I said, if you had no other verse in all of Scripture, if the Bible was one verse, one verse, if that's the only that verse you had, that would be enough Amen. for a person. To receive eternal life, which we should, we need to define at some point. We need to really flesh out what this eternal life is ontologically, substantively. This eternal life is received on the basis of one human act and one alone faith in Christ, faith in Jesus. I don't need to understand all the other collateral, wonderful doctrines his death, burial, resurrection. I know 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11. Again, it's about the gospel. It's not about the message of eternal life. Jesus did this. This is the gospel. How do I benefit from what he did? This is the message of eternal life, Rich. So the next time you're sitting with a person and you ask them how, if they say, you know, like a Philippian jailer, what must I do to be saved? Right. Believe and repent? Believe and confess your sins? No. Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. At that moment, he received the free gift of eternal life. So the, the message of eternal life is the offer of the free gift of eternal life. And we need to really define that at some point. We will, probably not today. The free gift of eternal life received on the basis of faith and faith in Him alone. And somebody said, well, it's too simple. Yeah. It's too free, baby. Right. Wait a minute. Well, you hear that, don't you? You do, but then, and I say, okay, go back to the good news about the gospel and the substance of it. What did, the, what did God have to do in order to make this experience and reception of eternal life so absolutely free. First of all, he had to become a man. Then he had to take on all of, which I don't know, I can't fathom with my uh, pea brain, all the facets of humanity, including in some sense a connection with sin, a holy righteous God, get ridiculed by his own countrymen, ultimately slain by the Roman government in, in collusion with, with the Hebrew nation, and then go through what he went through on the cross. I mean, just read the, the agony. <laughs> you know, I have Psalm uh, 22 and Isaiah 53 and those passages. Anyway, then he experiences victory over there, but he went through all of that. In other words, this is the way I like to put it, Rich. Uh, the good news about Jesus Christ, which is the payment for man's sin, includes a decision that God Almighty, your creator and mine, he made that he cannot reverse. This is one decision he can't change his mind on. The Son of God became a, an eternal human being. In other words, even in his present position, sitting at the right hand of the Father in what we call the third heaven, right. on the throne of grace, he is corporeal. He is flesh and blood. Flesh and blood. But he has a body that is also able to transcend the laws of physics. Obviously, he was taken up on the day of Pentecost before the very eyes mm -hmm. of his viewers. That's the kind of body you and me are going to hear this someday. You don't have to worry about hair falling out. <laughs> Keep, teeth rotting. Don't we'll have to worry about my hairline. <laughs> That's right, brother. So this this is what he did. He paid it. So he made a decision. I love my creation so much. Let's call it humanity. Mm -hmm. I love what I did. And even though they dug in their heels and I gave them the capacity, obviously, to choose a wrong direction or evil, I'm going to redeem them because I see the light. God so loved the world in that, in that statement, which is an allusion to the motivation why God sent his only begotten son, there's a sense of value. He loves something that has value, you and me. That's beyond me how he sees it, but he does. So I'm going to take care of it because I'm the only one that can. And I'm going to make a decision that's irreversible. Think about that. Yeah. Just from a philosophical point, you know, we can change, we can make decisions, we suffer the consequences of them, but, you know, we can change our mind and that sort of thing. But to think that God made a decision to manifest himself in human form, that he'll never change. This gets into the eternal perspective. What is he going to be doing in the future? What are we going to be doing with him, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the free gift that you and me have received, and Jim, and others, by faith in Christ and him alone, has been paid for, by all that Jesus Christ did. That's the good news. But I don't get saved by believing the good news. I get saved by believing that Jesus, who the good news is all about, says to me, now I've taken care of all of this. You're not going to stand, understand all the ramifications of this overnight. Rich, I've been at this for 40 years, and I'm still understanding the gospel. 
But I know one thing, at that moment when I believed in him for eternal life and got saved, that was irreversible and that was a free gift. Now I'm growing and developing in it. The gospel about Jesus Christ, the message of eternal life, connected viably, but separate and distinct, reflecting their own innate beauty and particular majesty. Let's talk uh, briefly uh, about... I love this, no commercials. Yeah, this yeah. is great. But let's talk briefly about... Uh, about the, you know, the, the process in coming to believe that, obviously, we have the Bible, uh, which is the historical document. Uh, tell us a little bit about, about why we should believe that. Because I do. Well, I mean, you know, this is the questions that we get. That well, we get. I understand it. Let, let me say, I mean, I'll, I'll address that question, but let me say, first of all, this I'm not the Bible answer man. Right. I think he's with the Lord now. Walter Martin, right? He was the Bible. Well, Hank, 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 and those guys. The, you know, I, I, I don't focus on the the the, the, uh, the uh, science of apologetics, although I can give a firm uh, response, a reason for the hope that dwells within me to anybody that would ask. <clears throat> um, I here's how I approach this question: How do you know that this is the Word of God? Uh, I said I don't, but I believe it. And I usually, let me, can I tell you a story that relates to yes, this? Okay. Sure. I'm in Starbucks one day, right? And I've got my Bible. Probably on. Yeah, and I'm sitting there and I'm reading. And there's a guy sitting across me. He's reading something too. And he keeps looking up at me. And I, I just notice him. So he, he gets up. He's done. He closes his book. He comes over to me and says, he says, uh, what's that book you're reading? And I said, it's the Bible. Is that a good book? I said, it's the best book I've ever read. I said, what are you reading? And he told me it was a book. I think Tom Clancy or, or, or Grisham, one of those. Mm -hmm. He said, uh, what's, what about this book? What makes it so special? And I said, well, God authored it. My creator authored this book through human agency uh, many years ago. Mm -hmm. Why do you know that, James? <laughs> You're crazy. Yeah, how do you know that? Were you there? And I said, no, I wasn't there. Obviously, you moron. Yeah, I wasn't there. I said, uh, he's just so as you just believe it. I said, yeah. Internally, the literary evidence says God wrote the book. No. I said, there's historical sources that we have, that we believe, support and undergird, the testimony that this is the word of God, written in scripture, holy prophet. And that's, uh, that, that bolsters our argument, certainly. But I have to admit, it's by, on faith. He said, yeah. He started, I said, wait a minute, before you walk away, I said, uh, may I ask you a couple questions? And I, and I, I just mean this for dialogue purposes. Sure. He said, sure, sure, go ahead. I said, what are you reading? He doesn't mean he's reading. I said, who wrote that book? He said, oh, the girl. I said, how do you know? He said, what do you mean how? His name is on it. I said, have you ever met this man? No. Were you there when he wrote it? No. How do you know somebody else didn't write and just use this name? Well, I don't. I believe it. Of you what? I believe it. I take it at face value. I, I, I. So you're saying that? Yes, faith. Uh, yeah. that, that Tom Clancy wrote the book. Exactly. Now, have you never met the man? I said, how do you know that Tom Clancy even exists? Well, I've seen pictures of him. Have you ever seen him in person? Have you seen his birth certificate? You take it on faith. You're absolutely right. So and, this is the bottom line, Rich. And that that also comes into into play with this with the translation questions that. That people get hit with. I mean, uh, people, different read, translation. people read Socrates, they read Plato, they read Freud. Uh, Freud never wrote in English. Uh, Socrates didn't write in English. So, you know, all these other books that you take uh, at face value, uh, you know, are translated from somewhere. Let's be well. intellectually honest. That's all. Yes. That that your belief system or what you what you consider to be factor evidence comes back to faith. We 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 can we can avoid this principle. But with regard to the the question of creation, of the origin of the earth, nobody on this planet today was alive when creation began. No. So we're taking and extrapolating out and drawing a conclusion from sources. Guessing. How, guessing. How do you know those sources are viable? How do you know even a Plato or an Aristotle? Well, they take it. They take it on faith. That's right. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> it's just faith. Yes, so that's about as far as I want to argue about and, and support the authenticity and reliability of the scriptures as the document inspired by God. I believe it. It says it is. There's enough external evidence 
to bolster that, but I, I'll be intellectual. I believe it. It's based on faith. And also, it would, I think, help uh, people who are questioning to take some time and, and maybe glance through it. It's the, it's the book, by the way. Give it as much it's, of a it, hearing it, as yeah, anything it's, else. It's the book that's up on your shelf there. Uh, you see the one on top with the gold? Uh, or, in the, or in the hotel room. It's embossed there with the, with the yeah. gold uh, uh, leaf. and the, right, It's, it's a little dusty on the yeah. top there. Brush that off. And, and uh, if someone was to pick up a Bible that's listening today okay. for the first time in years, maybe the first time ever, ever. Yeah. Uh, where would Excellent you suggest that they, what, that they turn to right Excellent away? Excellent question, Rich. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would, and I, I, I mean, this is for all people, and even those that are theologically maybe a little confused. I would start with the Gospel of John. Uh, I would start with the Gospel of John for anyone. And the reason for that is that clearly, in my study of the Scripture, the Gospel according to John, which comes right after Luke in, in the chronology, is the only book, Rich, written and part of the New Testament corpus for the purpose of bringing people to faith in Jesus Christ for eternal life. Well, let's let's that's the only. Let's book. start right there because in the first words of the Gospel of John is another one of these situations you were talking about before. If the John 1 was the whole Gospel, it, it might stand by itself. In, it, give us the, 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 uh, the opening uh, to the book. Well, in, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I mean, that's, God. I mean what, a, what, a, what an amazing, a breathtaking statement. Well, then you follow on in the prologue, and it, it explains who the Word is, who he's focusing on, and that's the person of Jesus Christ. And the whole Gospel of John is, a, is, is devoted to exalting Jesus Christ as the object of faith that saves. So getting back to your original question, anybody out there that is a novice at this and has hung with us for 45 minutes that uh, considers themselves to be skeptical or, or uh, uh, you know, not decided on this issue, I would say, if, uh, as you would read any other book, read the Gospel of John. And because, as you would read any other book, as you, with with an objective, right. open heart. That's all. As you and enjoy, if nothing else, the history, right. the movement of this Jewish renegade, if you want to refer to him, in the uh, along, along the landscape of Pal ancient Palestine and the interactions that he had with, like the woman at the well. My favorite, your favorite, Rich. John Ford. You did a great job of expounding that truth to us too. That I'm going to assign reading a year and a half ago. So, you know, read it objectively. Don't be afraid of it. And nobody's going to, I'm not going to thump you over the head with it, that's for sure. But that that's where I would say, John 3, 16, God so loved the world, motivation, that he gave. What motivated him to give? Love. What did he give? His only begotten son, not a good ace. That, whosoever believes in him, not behaves in him, but whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, just the, right. it's that opening verse of John, when you, which you went through, uh, in the beginning was the Word, mm -hmm. and the Word was God, mm -hmm. and the Word was with God. Mm -hmm. That, uh, uh, if, you just, if you could just for a brief moment expound on the, how amazing that is. And that, I mean, Jesus okay. was with God. He is God. It's the, this whole triumvirate uh, uh, nature. Uh, the triune. Uh, uh, right. uh, tell us a little bit about that, because well, because because on that uh, is a lot of there's a lot of stumbling that goes on uh, all over the world over that. As well. well, there's a major religion, which some call a cult, but it's a religion that uh, uh, interprets uh, the grammar here and the, the phraseology uh, to uh, support their theological tenet that Jesus was not. Deity was not God. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't want to get into all of that today. We'll, we'll discuss this at some other point. What I'd like to do is divert our attention back to the mission statement, Mitch. Okay. Is that okay? Sure. Uh, and uh, the second uh, fold of the twofold mission statement that the Messiah has. First one, remember, yes. is we are devoted to preaching uh, the gospel about Jesus and the message, proclaiming the message about the free gift of eternal life received by simple faith in Christ and Him alone. And once that gift's received, it can never be lost, given back. It can't. No matter no, no matter what life is lived from that point on, no matter how many pitfalls I fall into, how many trials I experience, how many struggles, how much sin am I, I cannot give that gift back or lose it. Okay. The second 
uh, fold in the twofold uh, mission statement is this. Once that happens, and this is what I'm trying to do with you and Rambo and the rest of the guys and gals, is the process of discipleship to Jesus Christ. In other words, once I receive this free gift of eternal life, you're, which going, I guess to, say, you're going to be around forever. Yeah, you're, you're going to live forever in the presence of God with a new immortal body and all the promises that come with that. That's yours. That's your package. That's an assured inheritance. Now, what do I do with the rest of my earthly life? Well, this is where discipleship comes in. This is where following Jesus, man, this is, this is where it gets really real. This is where it gets tough. Now, the Messiah ministry is committed to the mandate of our Savior in Matthew 28, uh, 18 through 20. Uh, let's, I don't have it in front of me, so let me let me see. But yeah, you know, uh, all authority, Jesus says, in the heaven and the earth has been granted to me. All authority, all exousia. So he's this, and he's telling his disciples this post resurrection. He's about ready to go back to be with his father and have a homecoming. And he tells his disciples, men who had received the free gift of eternal life and had followed him as disciples, that all authority in heaven and earth has been granted to me. He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go into the world. As you go, make disciples, you know, preach the gospel about Jesus, preach the message of eternal life, and for those who believe it, like you, Rich, and like uh, Jim, make disciples of me. And here's how you do it. By baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that's a, uh, a reference to water baptism, a one-time experience, and teaching them, this is the process, to observe all things that I commanded you, and no I will be with you until the end of the ages. So, in, in a nutshell, Minimasaya Ministry is committed to sharing the good news about Jesus, the message of the free gift of eternal life, received by faith alone in Him, and, once that happens, take that new convert and make a disciple of Jesus Christ, so that at the end of that person's life, they can look back and say, hey, my vocation, my commitment to Jesus Christ has been devoted to the experience of discipleship. So this points to, let me finish, right? This points to joint heirship with him in the eternal future. All of this is going to be rewarded. So the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 re the receiving of uh, the eternal life is a... The gift of eternal the life. The gift of eternal life is, a, is an event. One time. And the, the uh, growing... Uh, and becoming a disciple and making other disciples is a process. Bingo. So we have an event and then a process. And then a process. Yeah. It's like we got rush, then we got rich. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Way to throw it in there, Chuck. A little plug for my brother. And, and let me just uh, let me just reset. Yeah, this is uh, this is eternal perspective. With, uh, brought to you by uh, our dear brothers, uh, the men of Messiah. Who, by the way, when I say brought to you, I mean brought to you. They Amen. have they have rallied. Uh, uh, to uh, sponsor this radio program, and it's uh, it also features my my uh, teacher, my rabbi uh, Chuck DeVault, who uh, has opened up the, the opened up the gospel certainly to me to to look at it in, a, in really a completely different way than I have uh, my entire life in this in the process. Rich, share, share a little bit about your experience with Romans five. Are you willing to do sure? That? I mean, yeah. uh, I mean, I, I, well, that that was uh, you know, it was an tell, amazing. Tell the people about that's it. That's an amazing uh, eye opener uh, of the day. You know, I mean, I struggle with the flesh. Absolutely. I, I wish I did. Which we're going to discuss by the yes. end. Yes. We want to really know what that principle is. Sure. Uh, and uh, you know, and I think that that uh, in in other preachings, uh, you know, that put my uh, my salvation uh, in question. In other words, I shouldn't be struggling uh, with the flesh. If you're I, really saved, I, if you're really saved, you're really, if you're really saved, you know, you should be, uh, you know, or, you should be crap. Should go out and walk on water uh, right now. You never have another problem the rest of your life. You'll never have to struggle or suffer again. Uh, if you struggle or suffer, then you're not, you don't have enough faith. Let me ask you a question right here. This is really important. So how did you battle with this, these urges, these inclinations? These, you tried to do it yourself, right? Sure, I tried to sure. and failed uh, miserably. Yeah, miserably. Yes. Romans 7. Romans 7. Yes. And yeah. so then, you know, when I realized that there is, that there is a, a physical difference hmm. between the, the uh, spirit and the flesh, hmm. you know, hmm. it was an amazing eye-opener. And it made it easier for me hmm. to deal with those fleshly Amen. Uh, 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 pulls 
and struggles that we all have. Mm -hmm. Understanding that it's a process, not an event. Mm -hmm. and, and I got and, and that, that came to me, uh, you know, through just one of your uh, amazing uh, uh, sessions mm -hmm. with Madam Messiah. Mm -hmm. So obviously, I'm incredibly grateful mm -hmm. because that opened my eyes and it helped me. Uh, you know, not it didn't uh, it didn't help me. Uh, uh, I, I already was saved, but it, it opened my eyes to, to to the struggle that everybody goes through, and the difference between the spirit and the flesh, mm -hmm. which which you preach uh, differently yeah. than, than, than almost everybody. And, and else. that has to that has to be dealt with. Well, that's another subject: uh, the, the spiritual life and experience uh, depicted by the struggle between the, fl the flesh and the spirit. By the way, that Galatians five passage that you're appealing to, as well as other supplemental texts in Romans and Colossians. Uh, it says the battle is between the Holy Spirit and my flesh. You know, this is where right. I learn in partnership with the Holy Spirit, Rich, to, and I learned this, it's a process, to let him fight the battle of my own flesh under his strength, under his capacity, uh, under his leadership. Well, you know, you have to do that in order to win the battle. The only way to win it is to surrender. Correct. You know, and that's yeah. something that that uh, sometimes humans. But surrendering right. on the basis of security right. and assurance that you're not going to get kicked out of the family of God, nor if you fail, that this is going to prove you were never saved to begin with. So you, you know, that's that's. The, well, that's see, that's where Chuck. I mean, that's where men of Messiah, I believe, separate themselves mm -hmm. through your teaching from an awful lot of of. Uh, other ministries. Other ministries. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, I've heard preachers say, you know, if you don't do this, 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 and this, then you're, you know, you're probably not saved. I mean, I've heard that. Well, that uh, that particular idea is wrapped up, and, and we need to unfold that in a lot of detail, in uh, the what we call in theological parlance or circles the Lordship Salvation Gospel. In other words, uh, it's not good enough to believe in Jesus for the pre-gift of eternal life, although you must do that. You must surrender all. You must, in other words, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. Mm -hmm. So you must uh, follow him in discipleship. So they collapse discipleship passages or the process mm -hmm. into the terms of receiving eternal life. They make it fl faith plus all of this stuff. And that is not biblical. No, it's not. It, it's not in my opinion. It isn't. Not from my studies. And then they say, therefore, if he's not Lord, if he's, he's not Lord of all, if he's not Lord of all, if there's sin in your life, that proves you were never saved to begin with. You know, and what they always point to, uh, what I find, they regularly point to people who hold this Lordship Salvation Gospel is your sex life. Mm -hmm. If you don't, if, if he's not Lord of your sex life, man, he's he's not Lord at all. Mm -hmm. But then the guy telling me that is about 450 pounds. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying, so if he's he's, he's got to your sex life, that's okay. But if he's not, if he's not the, got to your well, belly, then but you know, you know, little dispensation there, huh? Well, there, you know, there. Every area of your life right. has to be under this. I mean, how stupid and, and and incredulous is that? It's a false gospel, and it's it, it betrays common sense. I mean, we're we we're spiritual people, but we haven't thrown our common sense into the wind. Well, in the last few minutes that we have here, Chuck, believe it or not, uh, let's let's uh, if you could just uh, uh, preach a little to uh, the people who may be turning in, uh, tuning in, I should say, for the first time to any kind of show like this. Uh, you know, this may be the first time they've heard anybody in a long time talk about uh, about uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, right. uh, let's reach out a little bit to, to those who are that. who are uh, who are tuning in and are wondering. How do I fit into this? What do I have to do? I want this. All of a sudden, you know, this this notion of eternal life is huge. It's huge, and it's, you know, I mean, it's something I think everybody, whether they even know it or not, wants mm -hmm. once they have some understanding. The reason I know that's true is, is because of Ecclesiastes 3.11. God makes all things beautiful in his own time, and also he has set eternity in the hearts of man. Yes, he has said so. In the and everyone, and every one of us in this room, and listening, having been created in the imago dei, the image of God, has a certain propensity, inclination, draw toward eternal things, and uh, that's what I want to appeal. We want to all live forever happily, joyfully. 
fulfilling, meaningful lives. Uh, the a few things in this regard, Rich. Um, honesty. Everyone is listening or watching or whatever. Be honest. Be ruthlessly honest about your life before God. Even if you you call him a higher being or whatever you want to refer to him, he, he can deal with those insults. He's got big, big, big shoulders. Big shoulders. Yeah. Just be honest about, you know, what's going on in your life, what you're experiencing as you hunger and thirst for something that's substantive and eternal. That's very don't, don't fabricate. Don't make you know, so difficult for the human being. There. So difficult for, for the human being to do without Arrogance. without Jesus. Uh, uh, yeah, it's impossible to, to for me you know, to live a, a fulfilling and meaningful life without him. Then begin to explore the alternatives to where this hole in my heart. Well, I don't have a hole in my heart. No. Okay. So I like to ask arrogant, self righteous people. So you're just you're fine with death. You know you're gonna die, idiot. You know, you know, yeah, I'll find, well, maybe I'll come back as a flower or something. You know, who knows? I mean, so, so you know, they, they just extrapolate and bring in all of this stuff. You know, the bottom line is, give, give the Word of God its presentation, its presentation, as much time and credibility as you would give any other document, any other document, and, and, and do it with an honest, open heart. When I got honest about my life, when I was out of control, Richie, yeah. that was the most precious moment. Unfortunately, throughout my Christian life, I've played the religious game. I'm not going to do that anymore, even on the airways. When people hear my voice, they're going to hear somebody that is madly, madly in love with the God of the universe and the person of Jesus Christ and is eternally indebted to his grace and love. And I can be free and honest. Honesty is the one word I would want to leave with people. That's integrity. Just with God. You know, not with your spouse or anybody else. Just with God. Be honest. Well, that's, you know, that's a good starting point there, Chuck, isn't it? <laughs> it right. is, It is. I think. Yes, a uh, good starting point. It is. It's a heck of a starting point. God, time's gone by so fast, huh? It goes, it goes by fast, I love Jimmy. it, Richie. Yeah, it's been a... I love uh, you, brother. Well, I love you too, brother. And uh, we want to thank uh, Jimmy Westford and uh, our good friend Jeff Harrison from, by the way, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, swingpointmedia.tv. If, uh, if you have something you want, uh, you want uh, promoted or you want uh, televised, uh, put on the internet, uh, Jeff Harrison. Uh, Jeff is a sweet soul, man. And he's he is a, a sweet soul. A tremendous help to uh, Jimmy and I. We thank the Lord for him. Yeah, been, Whether he realizes or not, God brought him into our lives. He's so. been a dear friend of mine for many, many years. And so uh, we're very grateful. We want to thank everybody. Thank you, Chuck. Great job. Yeah. Coming up, it's uh, it's uh, the Elevated Tea with uh, Maggie we'll be, McKay. We'll be back next week, right? We'll be back next week, I hope, oh, yeah. uh, unless, uh, you know, the bridges are burning. <laughs> I think we'll be fine. Uh, by the way, Friday mornings, every Friday morning at uh, Desert Island. 7 a.m. At 7 a.m., we have an amazing uh, Bible study. and uh, For men. For men. And just uh, tell them at the guard gate, you're there for the men assigned meeting, they'll direct you. It's a wonderful Bible study, and you're all and all men are welcome. Yep. Uh, let's see. So we thank you. God bless you, Chuck. It's a great job, brother. Thank, thank, thanks, Richie. We'll be back next Sunday at uh, 7 a.m., and I'll be back, of course, on the Monday at noon for the Rich Gill Gallon Show. Thank you all. God bless you. God bless uh, Chuck DeVoe, and uh, we'll see you next week. And don't be afraid to say God bless the United States, Rich. Huh? Don't be reluctant to say God bless the United States.